society wants to hear is, do you feel remorse for what what you did? Yeah, I guess yeah. I had I guess I would say I handled it in a in a um in an adolescent type of a fashion. You know what I'm saying? I should have handled it in a more you know adult fashion. You know what I'm saying? Because right now I'm suffering. My son is suffering. You know what I'm saying? I could be out there. I could have. Five years of my life went to waste, you know what I'm saying? Richard Martin Lloyd Walters was born on January 14, 1965. While often being referred as one of the best storytellers in hip-hop coming from New York, he was born and spent most of his early childhood in the Southwest London district of Mitcham. His parents were from Jamaica, who moved to the United Kingdom for broader work opportunities. When he was only 18 months old, Ricky got into a fight with a girl, during which a piece of broken glass got into his eye. After several unsuccessful eye surgeries, unfortunately, there was nothing that the doctors could do, and Ricky was ultimately blinded in one eye. To cover up, he used to wear Ray-Bans, but after a while, he decided to switch it to wearing an eye patch, something that would later become his trademark. At school, he wasn't as gifted athletically as other kids, but he was talented in other ways and indulged in Act for drawing. Unlike most kids, he didn't draw cartoons or graffiti, but preferred more real-life stuff. Although he spent a little more than a decade in the United Kingdom and even remembers life in there as more peaceful and slower than in America, he never formed close ties there. In the late 70s, when Ricky was 11, he and his family moved to the Bronx, New York, more specifically at East 241st Street and White Plains Road. Remember this address for later. He went to the LA Garia High School of Music and Arts, and at first, kids teased him for his accent and his sense of style. However, in time he made friends with guys like future DJ Vance Wright and future rapper Dana Dane. He and Dana instantly clicked, becoming close friends and eventually forming a group called the Kangle Crew. They started to perform everywhere that they could, school contests, parks, small local clubs and hip-hop battles around the city. At one 1984 battle in the Bronx, Rick met Dougie Fresh, who would later become known as the Human Beatbox, becoming a pioneer of 20th century American beatboxing. He was impressed by Rick's talent and the way he put together his rhymes. Doug made him a member of his Get Fresh crew, which also included DJ's Chill Will and Barry B. Doug's incredible beatbox skills and Rick's fresh flow made him a perfect duo, and soon Rick, under the name MC Ricky D, made his debut appearance on Doug's single, The Show. Hey yo, Doug, what? Put your ballets on. Yo, Rick, I was about to let need the shoe home. Why? An even more popular B side, Lottie Dottie. You know what? Your peep this, Lottie Dottie. We like the party. We don't cause trouble. We don't bother nobody. This single will become a piece of hip hop history as one of the most sampled and referenced tracks. La -de -da -de, we like the party. We like the party. As we go a little something like this. Hit it. How far you going back? Way back. <laughs> As we go a little something like this. Hit it. Oh, Ricky, 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 can't you see? Somehow your words just hypnotize me. Biggie, 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 can't you see? Sometimes your words just hypnotize me. At the time, both tracks gained some mainstream attention. They appeared on top of the pumps and Soul Train with Get Fresh Crew and put Slick Rick on the map. Bravo, also, if you didn't know, this is called the show. A year later, in 1986, he joined Russell Simmons' Rush Artist Management and became the third artist to sign to Def Jam Records, the leading rap slash hip hop label at the time. Collaborating with his high school friend, DJ Vance Wright, Walters produced a solo album called The Great Adventures of Slick Rick and released it on November 1st, 1988. The album was an instant success. It spawned for singles like Mona Lisa, Hey Young World, Teenage Love, and the classic. Rick's debut was like a breath of fresh air. Fans were mesmerized by his interesting sounding accent and unique narrative style, with music critic Matt Weiner later saying each of Rick's songs was an amusing and trawling story that lasted from the first group to the last. The album reached number one on the US Billboard 200 and fully solidified Slick Rick's name in the hip-hop world. He wasn't just a pioneer anymore, he was a star. While those four singles reached bigger mainstream success, singles like Treat Her Like a his collaboration with Dougie Fresh was quickly becoming an underground favorite. Treat him like a prostitute. Do what? Don't treat no girly well until you're sure of the scoop. Unfortunately, over 500,000 copies later, and with Madison Square Garden shows under their belts, their friendship abruptly came to an end. According to Ricky, he felt like Fresh wasn't paying him his fair share, a statement that he would later downplay to Clash of Ideas. Either way, the two decided to go their separate ways 
in different directions. Unfortunately for Rick, all of this fame and success came with a price. While being at the top, copying the biggest gold chains that you could find, and enjoying the fruits of your labor was more than joyful, paranoia was slowly starting to kick in. The newfound attention made Rick look over his shoulder more than usual, and it even got to a point where he decided to carry a gun with him in case something goes left. His mother Veronica didn't like that idea at all, and in 1989, she suggested that Ricky should hire his cousin Mark as a security guard for the Summer 89 tour with LL Cool J, Big Daddy Kane, and others. But what might have seen as a good and thoughtful idea that would make Rick's life a little bit more easier, unfortunately, it made it a complete nightmare. His cousin, Mark Plummer, arrived in New York from Jamaica, but as Walters claimed, he wanted easy money and drug connections not work. The problem started to emerge when shortly after hiring him, Mark started to complain about the money. Ricky was paying him $500 a week, but after some time, he still wanted more. With most of Rick Adventure's royalties tied up in real estate, he understood that there was no way he could pay him more than that right now, and he decided to give Mark $3,000, a van, and tell him to chill until his next album comes out. Mark, on the other hand, probably didn't understand what the term chill means, because unsatisfied with the outcome, he pressured his mother Veronica the same woman who helped him to get the job in the first place into giving him some cash. If that wasn't enough, Mark busted Ricky's shops in other ways as well. He wouldn't register the van in his own name and it accumulated tickets in Ricky's name, sending threats to not only attack him but also his mother and even going as far as hiring his own friends to rob him. After I fired him, all type of strange things was happening. I was getting robbed. People ran into my house, tied me up, beat and pistol whipped me. On April 20th, 1990s, at approximately 3 a.m., Slick Rick was sitting in his Nissan Pathfinder outside the Bronx Club when several men approached his vehicle. They came up to him and said, we want you, before they blasted 20 shots, hitting Walters three times and sending him, his female passenger, and a man standing nearby to the hospital. All of them miraculously survived, and Walters later claimed that he recognized the assailants as Plummer's friends. After he was released from hospital, Ricky came back to his home, only to find bullet holes in his front door. At this point, he was no longer paranoid. He was straight up scared for his and his family's life. After that, Ricky bought himself a handful of guns and a shotgun. He began carrying them almost everywhere he went and usually kept them in the back of his car. Walters would later tell the judge that he was so scared for his life that he was even afraid to come out of his own house. Slick's nightmare would abruptly reach its culmination on July 3rd, 1990s. Walters with his girlfriend, Lisa Santiago, who was 7 months pregnant, went out to get some Chinese food. Paranoid Ricky was carrying his automatic pistol in his waistband with other guns and ammunition scattered throughout the car. After they were done eating, they got into Walter's car and decided to go shopping for the unborn baby. While driving, Ricky spotted his cousin, Mark, coming out of a store on 241st Street and White Plains Road, the same street that Ricky grew up in. Walters reached for the closest gun to him and without hesitation started firing. His first two shots aimed out the window of the car as he drove past, missed Plummer entirely and hit the ankles of Wilbur Henry, an unemployed taxi driver who was standing at the curb. Walters then shot Plummer twice in the leg and once in the arm before Mark managed to escape into a store. Ricky pressed on the gas and sped off. Police officers patrolling nearby saw the incident and started to pursue Walters. He led police on a short high-speed chase south of the Bronx River Parkway, swerving between the cars, then tried to exit the highway with a sudden turn to the left lane. He missed just the distance and crashed into a tree. Walters was only covered with cuts, while both of his pregnant girlfriend's legs were broken in the collision. They were taken into hospital and shortly thereafter both arrested. Slick Rick was charged with two accounts of attempted murder, assault, use of a firearm, and criminal possession of a weapon. He called it an act of self-defense, but eventually pleaded guilty to all the charges and was ultimately sentenced to 40 months to 10 years in prison. His cousin, the man who made all of this mess, was shot and killed only a year and a half later in 1992, after he broke into a house and sexually assaulted a young boy. The boy's father shot him to death. While incarcerated, Walters kept himself busy by taking classes like music, commercial arts, school, shop, and a course in aggression replacement treatment. His only act of insubordination was refusing to participate in the general business program. He could have used it because at the time, he owed the United States government $100,000 in back taxes. 
He also released two albums, one in 1991 called The Ruler Is Back, which peaked at number 29 on the US Billboard 100, received mixed reviews, and was not as commercially successful as his debut. Another one was released in 1994 called Behind Bars. It peaked at number 51 on the US Billboard 200 and was met with lukewarm sales and reviews. After spending five years in prison, two for the shooting, and another three fighting with immigration services over his residency in the US, Slick was released from prison in 1997. Unfortunately for him, his problems weren't over, and over the course of the next nine years, he continued to fight for residency in the United States, even spending an additional 17 months in prison in 2003 after coming back from the Caribbean cruise ship and trying to re-enter the United States to Florida. The biggest problem was that he never was a United States citizen and now was a convicted felon, which ultimately prevented him from getting citizenship. But after nine long years of fighting, on May 23rd, 2008, New York Governor David Patterson granted Slick Rick a full and unconditional pardon on the attempted murder charges. This incident was used as an example when Shine's family sought a pardon from the same New York Governor, something I talked about in the previous video. Slick Rick in response to Patterson volunteered his time to mentor kids about violence. Walter's story is a perfect representation of life and how unpredictable it could be. While he was seemingly playing all the right cards, never getting into trouble, focusing on his craft, and trying to stay away from the streets as much as he could, it was he who ultimately ended up behind bars and not his cousin. Nowadays people tend to forget how legendary and iconic he was and still is. Slick Rick is one of the best storytellers in hip-hop history, which not only revolutionized the music scene, but also changed fashion and jewelry game as well. Rick is one of the hip-hop hall of famers, and while he's still alive and well, let's not forget and give him his flowers.